Good morning. I'd like to talk today uh, for a short time about Banjo Patterson, that's Andrew Barton Patterson's ballad, The Man from Snowy River. Now, this uh, poem is uh, well known, and there are some people, many people, in fact, who feel that it should be regarded as an Australian icon. Now, the word icon, a four-letter word, uh, easily spelt, easily pronounced, can have three separate meanings. An icon can be a religious painting, which uh, brightly coloured, often on wood, and beloved by particularly uh, the Eastern churches like the uh, Greek and Ukrainian Orthodox churches. An icon can be a symbol on your phone or your computer, which you uh, push in order to uh, open up an application. And thirdly, an icon can be a person or an object or a thing that um, is of historical importance and uh, which uh, people love and admire. And I think that uh, Banjo Patterson's poem, The Man from Snowy River, falls into that category. Now, the poem itself um, was the subject of a film which uh, was... Uh, produced in, I think, uh, 1988. Um, it uh, forms the basis for the uh, Man from Snowy River Festival, which is held at Coriong uh, each year and has been done so since uh, 1995. Uh, it's recited at many um, country festivals and indeed uh, Banjo Patterson appears on our $10 note, an image of him with a uh, horse and rider in the background. So that I uh, feel that um, it's uh, something that is worthy of consideration of being, and is worthy of being an icon. Now, the uh, production of the um, poem was first uh, published in 1890 uh, in the Bulletin magazine. Um, and there was another person who was involved in the production of the poem. And that was a man named, a man um, named Jack Riley. Jack Riley was a very different person to Andrew Barton Patterson. He was born in uh, Ireland in the 1830s, he was not well educated. He worked from an early age in a um, uh, tailor's uh, shop. And in fact, he came to Australia as an, assist an assisted migrant in, um, with, at the age of 13. Uh, in those days, this is in the... Uh, about 1850, 18, late 1840s, 1850, Ireland was suffering from the potato famine and many people were leaving Ireland. At the same time, Australia was looking for people who had trade skills and they were offering assisted passages to such people to come to this country. And uh, Jack Riley, uh, at the age of 13, came here unassisted as a, uh, a, as a migrant. He had a sister in this country who had lived at Omeo and who had been widowed. He landed in Sydney and he uh, travelled to Omeo and he got work in a, uh, uh, in a sh shop uh, producing clothing. His sister, after some time, a short time, his sister remarried and left the area so he decided that he wanted to do something else. And he got a job as a, a stockman on a nearby station. And he worked on this station or on other stations in the high country for the remainder of his life. He developed a reputation as being a skilled and fearless rider with a detailed knowledge of the high country. On one occasion, um, Andrew Patterson, Andrew Barton Patterson, 
uh, traveled through the high country with a couple of friends and they came upon Jack Riley's hut in which he lived on this uh, cattle station, cattle and uh, horse station. They got to talking, uh, lubricated probably by uh, some whiskey, and they uh, produced, um, he, he told pa Patterson of his life. Patterson was uh, amazed by the things that were done, he had done, and it was a, a conglomeration of those things that led to him producing the man from Snowy River. There was movement at the station, for the word had passed around that the cult from Old Regret had got away and had joined the wild bush horses. He was worth a thousand pounds, so all the cracks had gathered to the fray. All the tried and noted riders from the stations near and far had mustered at the homestead overnight. For the stockmen love hard riding where the wild bush horses are, and the stock horse snuffs the battle with delight. There was Harrison, who made his pile when Pardon won the cup. The old man with his hair as white as snow, but few could ride beside him when his blood was fairly up. He could go wherever horse or man could go. And Clancy of the Overflow came down to lend a hand. No better horseman ever held the reins, for never horse could throw him while the saddle girth would stand. He learned to ride while droving on the plains. And one was there, a stripling on a small and weedy beast, something like a racehorse, undersized, with a touch of Timor pony, three parts thoroughbred at least, such as are by mountain horsemen prized. He was hard and tough and wiry, just the sort that won't say died. There was courage in his quick, impatient tread, and he bore the badge of gameness in his bright and fiery eye and the proud and lofty carriage of his head. But still, so slight and weedy, one would doubt his power to stay. And the old man said, that horse will never do for a long and tiring gallop lad. You'd better stop away. These hills are far too rough for such as you. So he waited, sad and wistful. Only Clancy stood his friend. I think we ought to let him come, he said. I warrant he'll be with us when he's wanted. At the end, for both his horse and he a mountain bred. He hails from Snowy River up on Kosciuszko's side, where the hills are twice as steep and twice as rough, where a horse's hooves strike firelight from the Flintstones every stride. The man that holds his own is good enough. And those Snowy River riders on the mountain make their home where the river runs, those giant hills between. I've seen full many horsemen since I first commenced to roam, but nowhere yet such horsemen have I seen. So he went. They found the horses by the big mimosa club. They raced away toward the mountain's brow and the old man gave his orders. Boys, go at them from the jump. No use to try for fancy riding now. And Clancy, you must wheel them. Try and wheel them to the right. Ride boldly, lad, and never fear the spills, for never yet was rider that could keep that mob in sight if once they reached the shelter of the hills. So Clancy rode to Wheelham. He was racing on the wing where the best and boldest riders take their place, and he raced his stock horse past them, and he made the ragers ring with his stock whip as he met them face to face. They halted for a moment, when they saw their dreaded lash, then they saw their beloved mountain full in view, and they dashed between the, beneath the stock whip with a sharp and sudden dash, and off into this mountain scrub they flew. Fast the horsemen followed, where the gorges deep and black resounded to the thunder of their tread, and the stock whips woke the echoes, and they fiercely answered back from cliffs and crags that beetled overhead. But upward, ever upward, the wild horses held their sway, where mountain ash and Currajon grew wide. And the old man muttered fiercely, We can bid that mob good day. No man can hold them down the other side. When they reached the mountain summit, even Clancy took a pull. It well might make the boldest hold their breath. The wild hop scrub grew thickly and the hidden ground was full of wombat holes and any slip was death. 
But the man from Snowy River let his pony have his head. He swung his stock whip round and gave a cheer and he raced him down that hillside like a torrent down its bed, while the others stood and watched in very fear. He sent the Flintstone flying, but the pony kept his feet. He cleared the fallen timber in his stride and the man from Snowy River never shifted in his seat. It was grand to see that mountain horseman ride. Through stringy barks and saplings over rough and broken ground, down the hillside at a racing pace he went and he never drew the bridle till he landed safe and sound at the bottom of that terrible descent. He was right among the horses as they climbed the farther hill and the watchers on the mountain standing mute saw him ply his stock whip fiercely. He was right among them still as he dashed across his clearing in pursuit. They lost him for a moment where two mountain gullies met in the ranges, but a final glimpse reveals on a dim and distant hillside the wild horses racing yet with the man from Snowy River at their heels. He ran them single-handed till their sides were white with foam. He followed like a bloodhound on their track till they halted, cowed and beaten, then he turned their heads for home and alone and unassisted brought them back. His hardy mountain pony, he could scarcely raise a trot. He was blood from hip to shoulder from the spur, but his pluck was yet undaunted and his courage fiery hot, for never yet was mountain horse occurred. And up on Kosciuszko, where the pine-clad ridges raise their torn and rugged battlements on high, where the air is clear as crystal and the white stars fairly blaze at midnight in the cold and frosty sky, and where around the overflow the reed beds sweep and sway to the breezes and the rolling plains are wide. The man from Snowy River is a household word today, and stop and tell the story of his ride. Thank you.